Well, welcome to City Bible Church. Uh, again, we're trying to get used to saying that. Uh, we changed our name up three weeks ago, and by God's grace, uh, we've been here for 14 years proclaiming the gospel, and uh, we're excited to see what God has in store uh, for our new name uh, to bring glory to his name in this community. Uh, I invite you to get your Bible out. Uh, I'm going to walk you through today just a very uh, simple and I, I guess you could call it a systematic approach to to death. Uh, for most of you who are here today, you know that my brother passed away unexpectedly two weeks ago. And um, I'm not the only one in the room who's lost someone. You know, I'm not the only one who's lost someone very close uh, to you. And uh, we're going to push pause on our series through Romans. Um, I'm very, um, very staunch in our approach to verse by verse preaching here. But I certainly think there's times in the church's life and times in my life uh, where I need to push pause and uh, share something different with you. And today's one of those days, and I encourage you to get your, your Bible out. I want to talk to you this morning about a biblical look at death. And I want to talk to you about looking at one who, of course, passes away. I want to talk to you, the one, talk to you about the ones who are left behind. I want to talk to you about the reality of eternity. The Lord has brought you here by his grace on a good day. It is the Lord's day, and we are in the Lord's church, and I'm so grateful to be here with you this morning. You know, death and eternity is inevitable in our life, and why do we spend so much time trying not to talk about it? You ever think about that? It's something that we just really push under the, uh, push under the rug. It's something that we don't talk about unless we feel like we have to. Now, I'm not saying that you have to have an obsession with death. I'm not saying you go up and meet somebody for the first time, say, hey, my name's Luke. I'd like to talk to you about death. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is, is God's word is crystal clear to us about the reality that it is appointed unto all men that we will die and then face the judgment of God. We want to look today at God's word and be comforted by God's word. And I want you to experience the same comfort that I've experienced in my life over the last couple of weeks. For those of you who have lost someone, those of you who will lose someone, I want to invite you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And I want to start off by saying today that we have so much to rejoice about when someone is in Christ and they take their final breath. We don't have anything to rejoice about when someone is not in Christ and they take their final breath. I want that to be crystal clear today. The gospel is the forefront of everything that we say and everything that we do. But I want to read this passage to you, and it's an incredible passage, and it brought me so much comfort. It says this, a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. The living should think about this. The living should face this reality squarely. And then verse three, sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. This isn't the way that this sinful world wants us to view death. Satan wants us to believe that death is it, that nothing happens after one dies. But here in Ecclesiastes, we are told some radical truths about death. First of all, that when one dies and that person is in Christ, meaning that they have placed their faith alone and Christ alone, and they have been sovereignly born from above by the Spirit of God, drawing them unto faith in Christ, that when they take their final breath upon this earth, that that is actually better than the day that they were born. The final breath is better than the first breath. The final breath is better than the first. Well, how is that? Well, because for the believer, we must look at what they have gained. The apostle Paul said that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As Alistair Begg said it, he said, death for the Christian is to fall asleep in the arms of Jesus and waking up and finding out that you are home. Many of you I've stood and officiated at your 
loved one's funeral. So I look around this room and I've officiated many of your loved one's funerals. And at the graveside, I often share this illustration and I wanna share it with you because I think it's incredibly powerful. I want you to think back to being a kid. And there was nothing better as a kid than Friday after school and knowing that you had the whole weekend ahead of you, right? Like that's literally the best feeling in the world. And Friday nights for my household were a very special time. You know, my brother and I would stay up late. We would watch TV. We would watch different things. And, and our goal was to stay up as late as we could. But often what would happen is, is we would fall asleep watching TV on the couch or on the floor. And something miraculous would happen. The next morning, we would wake up and we would be in our beds. How in the world did that happen? How did I fall asleep on the couch? How did I fall asleep on the floor and then I wake up in my bed? I'll tell you what happened. And this didn't happen very often because my brother and I are big boys. <clears throat> Especially my brother, he's a real big boy. But what would happen is my mom or dad would lovingly come in and put their arms underneath of us and scoop us up in their arms and lovingly and carefully walk us to our bedrooms and draw down our sheets and our blankets and put us in our beds. And we would wake up the next day in a different place that we were, than we were the night before. To me, that's the perfect illustration of how the Lord takes home his own. You take your final breath upon earth and you take your first breath in heaven. That is the way that our God works. It is a mystery to our minds this morning. I can't fully understand it. I can't stand up here as a pastor. I can't stand up here as someone who loves God's word and fully explain it to you. But I can tell you this. I can tell you what the believer has gained because Revelation 21 tells us. A place void of sin. A place that is void of sin has no more of this. Listen. No more crying, no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And all the former hurts and struggles and worries and anxieties and the problems that this world brings us are now gone forever, are gone for eternity. And not only do we celebrate that, here's what we should celebrate. The believer has gained what is known in theological terms as the beatific vision, as they have beholded, beheld the glory of God. They are in the presence of God Almighty. They are with him for all eternity. The believer has gained all of that. And this section here in Ecclesiastes is teaching us that as we that as we learn and, and live our lives, that we grow much more through struggles and hardships than we do in times of pleasure. For my pastoral role, a funeral in a time of mourning has such a wide and amazing platform to share the gospel. And just from my own brother's memorial service, I have had the chance to share the gospel with more people than I can even count. I have had more people reach out to me via text message, through Facebook Messenger, calling me, emailing me, sending me cards, phone calls, conversations that I've had over the past two weeks that I wouldn't have had the chance to have with people if it wasn't for his final breath. The Bible teaches us that it's actually better to go to the house of mourning than it is to go to the house of feasting because a funeral, a time of mourning, because death forces us to stand and to face squarely the reality that I'm gonna face this one day, that I'm going to face physical death. And I had better be prepared to meet the Lord face to face. What the believer has gained in death is incredible. And while that's amazing, and more than our minds can fully understand, there are a couple looming and harsh realities that we face. First of all, for the one who wasn't in Christ, we don't have the peace in knowing that our loved one is with Christ. To die in our sins, to die without Christ is the worst of all. And I'm not here to tell you 
that your loved ones in heaven, they didn't have a faith in Christ because they're not. The Bible is crystal clear. And that should show us the urgency of the gospel. It should show us the urgency of preaching the gospel to a dying world. But here's the question I think, or I don't think I know covers all of us this morning. What about us? What about those who are left here? What about those who are left to mourn and to grieve, but also to read these passages of scripture and to be happy for our loved ones? What about us? How are we to deal with all of life ahead? Well, secondly, I want to encourage you to know, and you know this, if you're in the Lord, if you know Christ, that our comfort comes from the Lord. In Psalms 34, 18, it tells us this, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed and spirited. To be brokenhearted is ultimately in biblical context is to see your sin for what it is. To see that your sin is the greatest offense against a holy and a righteous God. And that understanding of your sin and your broken relationship with God because of that sin will move you to a brokenness over your sin. To be brokenhearted and crushed in spirit ultimately means that you understand your condition. You know the proper diagnosis. And the proper diagnosis is that we are totally bankrupt. We are totally lost apart from God. We know that we are totally lost and hopeless apart from our faith in Christ and Christ alone. And God's grace is the most precious gift given to those who know the brokenness of who they truly are. We can also know that when we are in Christ, that we are not, and I emphasize not, exempt from experiencing hurts and struggles and tragedies and ultimately physical death ourselves. Now, it's not that the Lord is far away and that a struggle comes into our lives and he takes a step closer to us. No, he's always with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. But often what happens is when life is on cruise control, we don't necessarily walk as closely with the Lord as we should. And then a struggle, a trial, a tragedy comes and we draw nearer to him. I can speak from experience and we don't preach experience, we preach the Bible. But when our experiences match up with scripture, we know that our experiences are true. And I can tell you that that is true. That some of the greatest lessons and spiritual growth that have happened in my life have come through struggles, trials, and tragedies. As James writes in the New Testament epistle, he tells us that we are to consider it pure joy when trials and struggles come our way. And why? Why does it have to be that way? Because it grows our faith. And ultimately, it is sanctifying us. It is purging us off of this broken and fallen world and fixing our eyes more strongly upon the reality of eternity and our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It drives us closer to the Lord and reminds us that he has never left us, but his closeness has always been there. The title of my sermon today is Living Well and Dying Well. And that's my third question that I want to raise today. Is I want to raise that question of, first of all, how do I live well, but how do I die well? No other passage to point to in scripture other than Philippians 1, 22 to 23. I want to read this to you and what the apostle Paul is writing here to the church is, is he's writing and he's showing the struggle that he has and, and, and living and, and, and having breath in his lungs, but desiring to be at home with the Lord. Listen to what he says. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. And then verse 23, I, I just see this, this passion in his voice. He says, I am, I am hard pressed between the two. 
because then he talks about his desire. He says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. And I would encourage you to underline this in your Bible. For that is far better. For that is far better. See, a biblical perspective on death, a biblical perspective on one who is in Christ is totally opposite of this world's. We see the apostle here wrestling with the two, wrestling with living his life now and knowing that living his life now, there is a purpose to his life. And the purpose to his life is to glorify Christ, to preach Christ, to preach Christ crucified, to preach Christ resurrected, to live for Christ in everything that he does, but also longing to be home. Let's quickly take a look at the two. For Paul, he shows us that living well, if you ever wondered what living well means, living well means to live for Christ. <laughs> it means to live for Christ. And I guess I could simplify it by saying it this way. All that we say, all that we do, all that we do in our lives should be to glorify God, to glorify Christ, and to walk in the Holy Spirit. This is what living means. This is what it means to live well. Living well is not living a selfish life where it's all about us. A life that has been accumulating, a life that has spent worshiping and glorifying ourselves, glorifying our children, glorifying their activities, glorifying our job, glorifying our career, glorifying our bank account, glorifying our business, glorifying ourselves. No, it is about glorifying God, giving him the glory, and the honor, and the praise for it all. Give him the glory for the job that you have. Give him the glory for the athletic ability that you have. Give him the glory for it all. Today and every day of our lives, I believe an honest assessment needs to be done. Is looking at our own lives and looking at what we value, looking at what we are figuratively bowing the knee to. How do I die well? That is the other question that is raised today is how do I die well? To live well is to live for Christ. To live well, as Paul says, is to live for Christ. Well, how do I die well? Well, to die well is to die, is to die in Christ, is to die in Christ. To the one who is crushed in spirit, that means that you know, you recognize by God's grace that he has shaken the scales off of your dead sinful eyes and you now see the reflection in the mirror for what it is, that you are a wretched sinner. And the only way for you to come back to right relationship and right fellowship with your righteous and holy God is by faith in what Jesus has done for you. To die well is to die in Christ, in Christ. To be crushed in spirit is knowing that you are a sinner and that you cannot fix your broken relationship with God on your own. There is no amount of works. There are no amount of deeds. There are no amount of efforts. There, are no, no, there is no amount of money that can make that relationship with holy God right again. It is by faith in faith alone, in Christ and in Christ alone, that we are made right with God. Today, I, I pray that through ultimately the truth of God's word, as we just have quickly taken a look at death and understanding the reality of death. I mean, there's so many passages that I could share with you today so many places in God's word that I could have pointed to and shown you the reality, but the simplicity of it is this. If you don't see your need for a savior today, I pray that today is the day that you do. I pray that today is the day of salvation for you, that you see the urgency that you're not promised tomorrow, that I'm not promised tomorrow, 
the next uh, breath that I draw is a grace of God. The next thing that I get to do in my life is a grace of God. The family that I have, the job that I have, the health that I have, everything that I have is a grace of God. And one day that's going to be taken away. One day I am going to take my final breath and I'm gonna stand before a righteous and a holy and a sovereign God. And the only thing that I can say is that I trusted in Jesus as the payment for my sins. Today, I encourage you to think about your life, to do an assessment of your life today. It is amazing through death how God is even glorified. Uh, through my brother's passing, my God is, our God has been glorified in such an amazing way. Through the death of many of your family members that I have known and I have stood and done their funerals and read you the scriptures and shared with you the promises of God's word and the, the, the reality of eternity, when are you gonna start taking it seriously? When are you gonna start living your life for Christ but also knowing and longing to be with the Lord in heaven for all eternity and recognizing that when someone passes away and they're in Christ, it is gain. It is gain.